we're going to talk about the same thing. It's a covenant wedding. So we're going to go through the book of Hosea. It's called Romance and Gomer for three weeks. And today we're going to stay directly on, on this wedding promise. The wedding promise of Hosea and, and Gomer can be found through all of scripture. We're going to talk about that. But before we get into it, I wanted to talk about my wedding so you can get to know me. There we go. And uh, that's my beautiful bride. And uh, so my soldiers, I was in the army, and um, she got up in church and shared her testimony, and I was like, wow, she is just stunning. And I don't even know what she said, but I was like, I have to marry her. But no, it was good. She shared her testimony, and it was, it was beautiful. And so it took me three months. She says four, I say three. And uh, so when I asked her, we were like, I think like two weeks in, and I was like, hey, you know, you're going to ruin me for other women if we're not doing this to get married. And uh, she said she wanted to run out the door at that time, like, what kind of, this guy is weird. <laughs> but it was the truth, and I didn't know what else to do. So, and uh, so it took about three months, and I was like, hey, just make a list. Like, what are the things I have to do to get married? Because I was deploying. And um, so then I was like, hey, if I asked you, I know it's kind of fast, would you, would you marry me? If I, if I, and she's like, no, you got to ask. And I was like, well, what if, like, I was deploying? Because she didn't know. I didn't tell her until I think a month or two in, like, hey, by the way, I'm about to go to Afghanistan. And uh, trying to convince her to marry me. So she actually made me do it, you know, traditionally and stuff. I was trying to just kind of ease my way into that. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that's, that's us. And the guys in kilts are, those are my soldiers. We had about a seven-man team. And they used to, they, they, they all dressed in kilts. I wore sandals because I'm classy. And for my wedding. And then they had kilts and tuxedo shirts. I don't know if you can see. You can't. They had tuxedo shirts. And they kind of threw out the thing that the bride walks on. So we had, like, some guys in kilts doing it. It was pretty cool. <laughs> every, every girl's dream, right? <laughs> tuxedo shirts, kilts, and your husband in flip-flops. And uh, pray for Jessica. <laughs> so let's get into the book. Let's get into the context. That's kind of the context of our wedding. The context of this wedding between Jose and Gomer is there was a civil war. So about 800 years before, seven, 800 years before Jesus, there's a civil war in Israel. And it was after, remember King David, he kind of sets up the dynasty, right? He's the big guy everybody loves. Then Solomon comes near the end of Solomon's life, his son, he kind of wavered in following God, and there was civil war in the kingdom. So the kingdom of Israel is divided up into north and south. And so the southern kingdom, they are the people of Judah. They call themselves the Ju Judah. So if you, the Bible kind of feels like they're separated there, they actually they are. And so the southern kingdom is, is Judah, and they suffer a Babylonian defeat because they have false gods and idols. And actually in Isaiah 5, the reason, final straw is there's no mercy among those people. And so Babylon comes in and they defeat them. But remember Daniel and the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and away we go and all that stuff. Well, they come back and rebuild the temple, right? So they remain God's people, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is not so lucky. Hosea is a prophet to the northern kingdom. Remember, 700 years before Jesus, a prophet to the northern kingdom. They're having the same problems. They have all these false idols, and we'll get into the reasons that I think God ends up destroying them. But the uh, northern kingdom, they call themselves Israel or house of Israel. It's kind of confusing because sometimes in the Nor New Old Testament, they'll say Israel, and it'll, it'll refer to both. So you kind of get in there and get some nuggets out of it. Well, the northern kingdom, after the split, they're referred to as Israel. They suffer a, a, an Assyrian defeat, the Assyrian military. But the Assyrian military is different than the Babylonian. They actually come in to the kingdom. They pretty much kill all the dudes, and they make the women their wives, and they, their whole culture saturates the people, right? And so the northern kingdom, remember the name of the What was the name of the kids? Do you guys remember from the play? One, one of them was called Not My People, right? Hosea's children. It was called Not My People. So literally, this northern kingdom, they become the Samaritans in the Bible. The Samaritans in the Bible, you know that phrase, good Samaritan? That was like saying good terrorist. It was like is an oxymoron, right? So they actually become not God's people. The gospel first goes out from Jerusalem to where? Samaria, Acts chapter 4. So not my people become my people. So this promise, this covenant promise that we're talking about, it, it is from the beginning to the end of the Bible. The beginning to the end of the Bible. And this covenant promise that we talk about in Hosea, we can actually see play out 800 years later. And we're going to get into that throughout the series. And so the engagement... 
uh, Hosea's engagement was a little bit different than mine. I call this the engagement. And so God comes to Hosea. This is Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. This is 2a, the middle of the verse. The Lord, this is the Lord talking to his prophet Hosea. Listen to this. And again, this is pretty brash, pretty crash, pretty harsh. This is not the Chris translation of the Bible, CTB. This is ESV. This is the one I read, and it's got some serious words. So if you don't like him, talk to God about that. Ready? The Lord said, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom. Strong word. And have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. I can't really think of a more crash word than whore. Right? Wow. How's that for an engagement? And this is not just any man. Think about it. It's not just some like old guy. We look at the Bible and think it's some weird old guy with a beard and, you know, he's doing all kinds of weird stuff out there in the Middle East. He's not. This is a prophet of God. This would be like, hey, Andrew, preacher of the church. We found you a wife. She's a prostitute, but we found you a wife, right? It's totally different lifestyles, totally different people. And he tells this to Hosea. And I just want to encourage you. This is not what my sermon is about. But I just want to encourage you. Whose baby is that? It's my baby. (laughs) I just, I want to encourage you that God speaks to you. He spoke to me this morning, woke me up. He speaks to all of us every day. And the way, can you imagine if he told you this? How would you know if that was God? You gotta be in this thing. This is his word. You gotta swallow it up. It, you gotta write it on your heart. It's not about memory or any of that. It's writing it on your heart. It's a foundation for your life. You write it on your doorpost. This becomes who we are. And Hosea heard this insane thing. I mean, insane thing from God. Go marry a prostitute. And he did it. Isn't that crazy? So God does that with us. And the name Hosea, uh, if you could put up the next slide, the name Hosea, it's the same name as Jesus. Isn't that cool? So the Hebrew root of that word, you can kind of see they're very similar. The Hebrew word of that, that the Hebrew root of that word is Yesha, like Hosea, Yeshua, which means salvation. Jesus literally means salvation of God. Hosea's name means salvation. He's what we call a prophetic type of Jesus. Did you know? This is like one of my favorite things. No, no there you go. Did you know? That Jesus, Yesha, Hosea, is from the very beginning of this in Genesis chapter 1, especially chapter 3, all the way through Revelation. God doesn't change from front to back. His plan A is Jesus. Understand? Not his plan B. And this is a prophetic type of Jesus. In fact, the Bible says this. I'm not making this up. Ephesians 1.4. God chose us. In Christ, remember that, in Christ, very important, before the foundation of the world. And that's not so we can create all these crazy doctrines. The reason that is because we were in Christ before this thing started. He chose us. It's always, been the, it's always the plan. Grace and mercy has always been the plan of a jealous, personal, loving God. And so this is the story of Gomer, the prostitute, and Hosea, the holy man, the prophet. And it echoes the story of Israel, the northern kingdom in this case, and God. And it echoes our story of me, Gomer. I'm a Gomer, especially with my testimony. Y'all are Gomer. Some of you don't know it. You're Gomer. I'm Gomer. And God and Jesus, right? Yesha, salvation, Hosea. So that's what the story is. And we all offend God. Listen to their offense. Their offense comes in Hosea chapter 2. Kind of the setup of the book is the marriage and then the reasoning. And then number three, the buyback. We'll get into that next week. And then all the next chapters are the reasoning and mercy and punishment and mercy and punishment. And so the, 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 the reason that Israel is called a gomer, listen to this. This is Hosea chapter 2, verse 5. Verse 10, verse 12. For she said, I will go after my lovers. Next verse. In the sight of my lovers, which my lovers have given me. So they're, they have a bunch of idol worship and a bunch of sin. And they call it Baal worship. What's God call it? Your lovers. Wow. Do you know what Baal means? The word Baal? So they brought in this Canaanite god. They made all these alliances. The kingdom was in civil war, so they turned to other gods. Now they're prosperous. Sound familiar? Now they're serving Baal. 
Baal is not just this like uh, golden calf in the sky. Baal was a name that meant Lord, Lord of, Master of, Lord of. And so there were gods attached to like every single thing in their life, and they were all called Baal, right? So there's the Baal of wine. There's the Baal of grain. There's the Lord of money. There's the master of my job. There's the spirit of the doctors I go to. And I thought, wow, how familiar is this to my own life? See, I think the disservice we do is that we don't think all these other things that are spiritual are spiritual. We're kind of like a little bit atheist in that way, aren't we? Oh, it's alcohol's not spiritual. <laughs> yeah, it is. They're spirits. We live in a spiritual world, right? And so they were thanking this spirit for what God had provided them. And I, I was going to get on that. I was going to, like, get on you because I'm from the south. And we kind of, we say at church, like, my, you ain't preaching unless your toes are bloody. And it was just dragging your feet on the ground. And I was like, ooh, the, y'all got bales, don't you? You got bales. And so I was thinking about, like, what kind of bales do you have that I can tell you about? And I was praying through it, like, ooh, I'm going to bring it. And God's like, Chris, you have bales. You know who my bale is? Me. This is my idol. In so many different areas of my life. And then the Lord actually started to speak to me. And he said, it's not about bales. It's not about sin measurement. It's not about bail measurement. Read more of my word. So I started reading. And I found this. Ready? Hosea 2.8. This is the real reason God's mad. Listen. So he goes on why he's going to punish them and all that stuff. Why he's going to punish Israel. He said, and she did not know, that's Israel or Gomer or us, that it was I who gave her the grain. It was I who gave her the wine, the oil. It was I who lavished with on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. What does that sound like? Jealousy, right? God is jealous. Like we think God is transcendent and far away. Every other religion is man ascending to this transcendent God. Christianity is the only exclusive religion where it's God himself descending. Listen again. God is a person. He is a jealous lover. In fact, he's called the lover of our soul. Marriage itself is given so that we can understand God in Ephesians 5. Our love for one another, uh, like what Andrew says in his class, our love for one another in the church, Andrew, what's he say? He said as in his leadership class, always hope, hope all th- I hope all things in every relationship, I hope all things. I have learned that from him. He really does. That is a picture. Our relationship with each other is a picture of God. Corinthians 13, that's actually written to Christians who are in a fight with each other. Listen to God's offense because he's a person. He gave us relationships. He wants a relationship with us. This is a person. This is a jealous husband. Listen again. She did not know that it was I who gave her the wine. It was I who gave her the grain. It was I who gave her the oil. It was I who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore... That's the reason for God being angry, his jealousy. Therefore, I will take back my grain. I will take back my wine. I will take away my wool and my flax. Listen to verse 10, 210. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. No one shall rescue her out of my hand. Wow. This idea of love in the world, they tell you you can be whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. I have to accept you the way you are. God's not. God is a jealous husband. Imagine if I went to my wife, and I know people who do this, and I said, hey, honey, I'm going out tonight. I'm going to the strip club. She's like, yeah, that's cool. My husband, I trust him. Would she love me? No. That's not love. You kidding me? I know Christians who do that. Love? That's not love. God's love, it's not like the jealous boyfriend that's like, you know, like my sons, they're getting in high school. They might get a jealous girlfriend that's like texting them all the time. Where are you? And I'll say, you know, it's not this perverted jealousy. This is the, God's love is fierce, the Bible says. It is passionate, the Bible says. He is a person, and he loves with passion. And so he's upset. He is really, 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 really upset. Do you know what I would do if I was God in this situation? I'd probably stop right there. The wicked are made for the day of judgment, 
judge him. But he doesn't. Because why? What's Hosea's name? What's Jesus' name? And that's the plan from the beginning to end. So if you follow chapter 2 and you go to verse 13, you'll see this. End of verse 13. And, I went, or, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, declared this to the Lord. There's another therefore. Remember, therefore is the reason you do something, basically. So the nation forgets God, and you would think God would continue to punish him, but God won't let himself be forgotten. And so listen to what he says. This is verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her into the wilderness. That sounds kind of weird, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's sensual language. I will allure her into the, I will bring her into the wilderness. It's basically saying I will, I will bring her to this table of romance. And then if you follow this down to verse 19, this is the covenant. This is covenant language. Listen to this. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love, in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And so that presents a problem to me, right? Especially the Old Testament believer, especially us as Christians, we start measuring Baal. It's mostly what we do. We start measuring Baal worship. And so you have this holy God. He's super angry. He's really upset. He's a person. His love has been offended so much so that he disciplines and punishes. And he gets to the point where you would think that it's all going to be over. He's going to rain hellfire and brimstone and wipe him out. And then he makes him this promise. Listen to this transition. It's crazy. Verse 13, she went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Next one, therefore, because she forgot me, behold, I will lure her and bring her to the wilderness. Then make this covenant with her. I'm going to say it again. I will betroth you to me forever in righteousness, in justice, in steadfast love, in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And for me, I think, how can I betroth? You know, it is to be in something, right? How can I, how can I be betrothed in righteousness when I, I am not righteous? Like, how can God even do that? He's holy. God cannot even look upon sin, the Bible says. He cannot look at it. He does not look upon sin. It burns up in his presence. That's what hell is. And it's real. And so I think, how can I, how can I be, like, Jesus says this. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. And this is the, old, this is the idea of how holy God is. No one is good except God. And so I think about this promise, and it's really, really hard for me to believe. I am not righteous. I am not just. I am not steadfast in my love. I am not merciful. I am not faithful. How can a holy God make this covenant with me? And I think it's all about this preposition, in. A preposition is a word governing and usually preceding a noun or pronoun, expressing their relation to each other. Right? <laughs> In. So who, who are the nouns here? The pronoun, the big holy noun, is God. The little noun is me. What's our, relation to, our relationship to one another in this verse? In righteousness. The Bible says this. This is Corinthians 5, 21, the end of it. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in, that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's called imputed, not imparted. Imputed righteousness. It becomes who you are from the inside. And so a lot of people are in church. And so I got this sermon illustration. My family made it. You're going to love it. That's Jesus. You can throw that next slide up. And these are all kind of like sin, right? Sin. My kids drew all the little ones. And Jessica drew the big Jesus. You can, it's, uh, it's up there somewhere so you can see it. Yeah. I know, they're so cute. Cute little sin. <laughs> so all the little ones, the kids do this, and, and Jessica did Jesus, right? I got to be in Jesus. A lot of times in church, we're just around Jesus. And so the Bible says I have to be righteous. I have to be righteous. The way to righteousness for me is Jesus. But Paul says himself, my righteousness is a filthy rag. Do you know what that Hebrew word for filthy rag is? You're not going to like this, ladies. A menstrual rag. My righteousness, the Bible says. Look it up. I didn't make it up. My righteousness, my best action, the most I can do, that my good standing, the best I am, is what? 
a filthy rag because sin it's sin because all I know is sin. The Bible says I'm dead without Jesus. So how can I make a covenant with a holy God? Here's how. You ready? So I have envy in my life. That's a little green guy. He's envy. And to cover up that envy and that jealousy, I just sin. Makes me feel good. And then I get really angry. This is the little terrorist that Gabriel drew. This little red one. I get super angry. Right? This this, this is Samaritan. <laughs> I get super angry. And then Jude, he's six. He drew this one. He said, uh, this is a beard of sin this guy has. And so I just grow a beard of sin. I don't care no more. I'm slothful. And then I can't deal with that and stuff. So here's my, one of my favorites. I lie and I cheat and I steal. This is a liar, cheater, stealer, all that stuff. And I'm just bottling everything up, bottling. I don't know how to do anything without God. I can't become righteous. I can't do nothing, right? And then this one, I know everybody's wondering what this is. And I just, after I can take everything I can take, I flip this over and I eat ice cream. <laughs> That's all I could come up with for sin. Just joking. I have a real sin. So I'm going to get rid of the ice cream. Because it's hard to focus with that up there. <laughs> so here's all my sins, right? And, uh, and when you see these two things, tell me what you see. You see sin and Jesus. Right? God cannot look upon sin. It burns up. I could burn up. And a lot of people, so for me, I was baptized as a baby by Catholics. I was three months premature. I was baptized by babies. And then uh, we never really went to church. My dad did instill me the gospel, but I didn't believe it. And so I believed in all religions. And I was actually really comfortable. I didn't go to church like regularly, but I was really comfortable, super comfortable going to church. Why? Because I loved being around Jesus. Man, I loved what Jesus said. And every time I go to churches, I meet, I'm talking in a, in, a, in, a, in a room this big, 10 or 15 people, that, their story is exactly like mine, but right when I'm saying it. And they've been in church 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, 2 years, whatever. But they've been around Jesus. Like, if I'm in front of Jesus, what do you see? You see me, sin, and Jesus, and God doesn't look upon sin. I can be behind Jesus. I can get behind most. This is a lot of people. I can get behind Jesus. He is a good teacher, great teacher. I'm behind 75% of what Jesus says. If you don't know, front to back is everything Jesus says. It's in your Bible. Front to back. I'm behind 75% of what Jesus, but I cannot get behind. I can't actually get in that. That's where most people are at. And when you turn around, because God sees all things, what do you see? Me and Jesus, and God can't look upon sin. And that's most people. In fact, (laughs) Man, when we tell people about Jesus, we usually just try to get them around Jesus and to do Jesus things. And we forget that there's only one way for them to become righteous, right? It's this easy. This is how I can be righteous. In Jesus. If I'm in Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes on him, about him, most of what he says, in him. C.S. Lewis said Jesus is a liar. A lunatic or Lord, you can only have it one way. He ain't a good teacher if he ain't God. He's just straight crazy. So I have to be in Jesus. That is the only way. That is the only way I can do it. And listen to this. When I'm in Jesus, Romans 8, 39, this is the promise. I am now the righteousness of God. You can't take it away from me. Because when God sees me, what does he see? His perfect, spotless son. Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? He said, what sums up the law? What did Jesus say? That's right. Who's the only one person that ever lived that did that their whole life? Who's the summation of the law? Jesus. And when God sees me, he sees the way, he sees the truth, he sees the life, he sees his perfect spotless son, I am a child, you are a daughter or a son of God. When he sees you, when God sees you, he sees Jesus, because he has made a covenant with you. Since the beginning of this book to the end of the book, you see it in Hosea, 700 years before Jesus. Romans says this, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God where? In 
Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you Christians that are here today, beloved, bride, people of God, listen to me. When we, you're going to do, because I wanted to do it before the sermon. What did I want to, what did I say that I wanted to talk about? Bales. I want to talk about your Baal worship and my Baal worship. Did that work for Israel? No, they just kept getting disciplined and worshiping Baals and all that stuff. That's what we do to people, don't, don't we? Hey, pastor, can you come help me because uh, so-and-so is uh, doing this and this and this, and I want to change their behavior. Hey, pastor, can you come help me? And I could just list them out. What are we doing when we evangelize people? I want to encourage you, share your testimony, share being in Jesus, and watch what God does with his word and with his testimony. So just want to encourage you if you're a Christian. Second thing, if you're a Christian, that I want to encourage you with is um, we just... We kind of even list things out in, in our own life, right? This is what I'm doing. This is not, I just want you to recognize, like, who you are, who you, who you actually are in Jesus. What you've become is the righteousness of God. And the Bible tells us to grow in what? It says, work out your blank in fear and trembling. What is that? Work out your salvation. We grow in our faith. Not that you're not going to be saved, because once you're in Jesus... I can't take you out of here. That's why it's a bad example because I could throw this on the floor and it would, it would break. But Jesus won't break. So we're supposed to continue working out our salvation. If you have bales in your life like I have bales in my life, I promise you there is, there is one main reason. It's mistrust. We mistrust God with money. We mistrust God with friendships, with fun, with time, with yada, yada, yada. We mistrust God. We mistrust God. And then we have bales in our life. And if God wanted us to meet a list or meet a list of bales, or stop worshiping bales and all that stuff. If he was that kind of God, he would have gave us a list. He abolished the list because he fulfilled the list, right? So I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian, to grow in your faith. I could tell you how to do that, but that would be giving you a list. <laughs> You've got to get with the Lord. You've got to do that. What? How do you feel in Christ Jesus? Just do that. It's super simple. If you are not a Christian today... I am not trying to fix you. I got my own stuff. I was saved in the red light district in Nuremberg, Germany in 2004. Uh, the first year of my marriage, listen to this, I looked at pornography the first year of my marriage. And I told my, I wanted to stop. I didn't get caught. I just told my wife because I wanted to stop. Do you know that she had made a covenant with me in righteousness, in justice, in mercy, and faithfulness? She was betrothed to me and all those things. She never once, not one time, withheld her love. Not affection. Not intimacy, physical, emotional, all that, not one time. And that is why I have victory in my life. I do 12-step programs and all that stuff. But the real reason I have victory is my wife understands God's covenant. And no matter what I did, she was faithful because she made a covenant with the Lord. And she, that man, I grew so much of my faith through that. That's what we're supposed to do with each other in the church. That's what we're supposed to do in our marriages. If you are not a Christian, you will find that here. I promise you. I promise you, you will find that in this church. If you're not a Christian, listen to this. The, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in? In Jesus. And the band is coming back up. Here they come. <laughs> hey, if we don't preach the gospel, we're not preaching, right? That's Romans 6.23. Uh, I want to tell you, if you're not a Christian, I used to think that God's love was like kind of milk toast, you know, when I was a universalist, like, I'm good. Jesus said no one's good but God. I used to think I was good, and I used to think that I deserved something, and, and then I saw some terrible things in my life, um, being a soldier, working on an ambulance, you know, all that stuff. Sometimes we're in a bubble, but there is terror in Wenatchee, even in Wenatchee. Like, Linda said something that broke my heart. Uh, she said with kids, you don't even know the reasons that they go hungry. Like, I, I need God to care. I need God to be just. And he, you know what his name is? Justice. He is justice. That's why there's a hell, and that hell is real. And the wages of sin is what? Death. And this is our one part in the whole deal. The free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you. We're going to sing the song. If you guys could stand, we're going to worship and sing the song. And I want to encourage you again, if you've been a Christian for a while, just take time uh, and just think about those areas in your life. More importantly than you becoming holy and getting rid of bales, think about the people in your life that you want to give the gospel to. 
that you want to be in Christ Jesus. If you're not a Christian, I'd love to talk with you. That could happen now. That could happen this week. That could happen later. But I want to pray with you, and I want you to start being in Christ Jesus. Let's sing this song.